Let's talk context first. Lamentations, as you know, is uh, written probably by Jeremiah um, to the people of Israel directly following the absolute demolition of their capital city, Jerusalem, in 587 BC. Um, of course, for generations prior to that, God's people had been chronically disobedient to him in just about every way imaginable. And after this progression, finally God had um, initiated Babylon's coming, their long siege on the city too, um, plus years, Nebuchadnezzar's then final destruction of Jerusalem in 587 BC. Oxford professor Philip Ryken says, the book of Jeremiah ends with the factual account of the last desperate days of the, Jer of the Jerusalem Jeremiah knew and loved. The book of Lamentations is an attempt to interpret the meaning of that catastrophe. And so here you've got this people, after this vast, sort of just, well, just a destruction, an ending, that it's hard to put words to. They are still numb with grief. And here this spokesman emerges from amidst this people who also is himself numb with grief but attempts somehow to give expression to the emotions and the, and the intellectual wanderings of where they find themselves at this point in time. In the Hebrew Bible, uh, as you well may know, Lamentations is called How after the first word in the book, how lonely sits the city that once was full of people. And how, I think, is a good word for this book because it is a word of exceeding measure, right? One that communicates both the extent of something too big to express and often um, one's resulting emotion from something of that scale. How kind it was of him. How I wish I had never said that. How deep the Father's love for us. Which is why I think the way the book of Lamentations is written is fascinating. Um, again, as you well may know, uh, this book, a collection, of course, of, of funeral orations or dirges, uh, laments, basically five poems, each connected to the other, essentially um, funeral orations expressing grief for the loss and then all of the emotions surrounding that loss and grief. And together, you know, through the Book of Lamentations, these motions, um, these movements, um, together form this progression from this place of terrible loss and personal shame toward somewhere where there's at least a, a sense of the possibility of restored hope, where there is a prayer for renewal. And so the whole thing, of course, is just this deeply emotional expression. But what's really interesting to me is that though it is deeply emotional, it is not a rash outburst. And that is evident, if, if for no other reason, from the fact that this is a book of poetry. And, well, specifically with Lamentations, its first four poems are acrostics, um, which, is, which is perfect for something like this because you've got the entire Hebrew alphabet, right, giving full expression to the sufferings of this poet's people and the sorrows of his own heart. But this poetic structure, poetry is, of course, so full of structure. And so you've got this sense of order amidst all of this chaos and tragedy. And it's a, it's a great layering of the, of the chaotic reality in which they find themselves and, and this ordering of that reality by way of poetry giving expression to all the feelings that are swirling around in the midst of this. Chapter 3, um, every line in each three-verse segment of chapter 3 begins with the same letter. Um, and you've got this rhythm based on lines of two unequal parts. The first part, three words. The second part, two words. Three accents, then two, rising and falling, rising and falling, this cadence, um, creating a poem that seems to limp appropriately enough, as if, itself, um, as if it itself was stumbling behind 
a funeral procession. It explores themes, chapter 3 does, of confession and hope and dependence, God's sovereignty. But of course, the whole thing is pretty dark in tone. We read a passage from it a moment ago. Here's another few words from chapter 3. I am the man who has seen affliction by the rod of the Lord's wrath. He has driven me away and made me walk in darkness rather than light. Indeed, he has turned his hand against me. Again and again, all day long, he has made my skin and my flesh grow old and has broken my bones. He has besieged me and surrounded me with bitterness and hardship. He has made me dwell in darkness like those long dead. He has walled me in so I cannot escape. He has weighed me down with chains. Even when I call out for help, he shuts out my prayer. He has barred my way with walls, with blocks of stone. He has made my paths crooked. It's as if we can't mix enough metaphors in to the bowl as we attempt to express where we are at this point with God. This is a prayer in protest. And... The place in which Israel finds itself, the place in which this poet finds himself, is, is one that you know, harkens back to Job's situation, just one of extreme um, desolation and suffering. Of course, Job's suffering, um, this is a key difference, was, was not the result of his sin. Jerusalem's suffering very much is of their own making. Rudyard Kipling spoke of... Um, realities like this in his poem, uh, Natural Theology, he said, This was none of the Lord's pleasure, for the spirit he sets in man is free, but what comes after is measure for measure, and not a God that afflicted thee. As was the sowing, so the reaping is now and evermore shall be. Thou art delivered to thine own keeping. Only thyself hath afflicted thee which for Israel is absolutely true and in some ways false. They have prompted God to afflict them. And some of it is just the nature of disobedience. We, when we disobey God, when we walk in paths that are not good, that are not straight, we incur both His active wrath, but then also we walk in sort of the, the physics of the universe being aligned against us because the way God has outlined for us is good and any other way is just not. I think about my dad who in 2008 things with him and my mother because of actions on my dad's part that had gone on for years finally came to a head and they got divorced after 30 years of marriage. And now, eight years later, my father still is in a very difficult place. He is walking a path that is not illuminated. It's dark and it's hard. And he finds himself again and again bumping up against this reality that when we go outside of what God wants, we find ourselves suffering in various ways. Of course, I know this reality well myself. And I suspect every one of us does. In a moment or during a season, perhaps, when we choose to disobey, we find after a season of that disobedience, or even just a moment of it, that there were good reasons that God had for giving us the command that He did. I try my best to help my daughters understand this again and again. I tell them, you don't have to understand why I make a rule in order to trust that there's a good reason for that rule to exist. And often they'll choose to disobey and then they'll find themselves in tears and I try to be comforting and I try also to capitalize on the clarity of that moment. 
I promise you, you see it now, you didn't see it before, there will be a time in three days where you won't see the reason for my rule, but I promise you there is one and it almost always has to do with your well-being. Please trust me. And Israel didn't. And here they are, reeling. But that suffering that they're experiencing can be productive. Right? Riken says when suffering is deserved, it ought to produce not complaint, but confession. And that can be the great result of the suffering we experience when walking outside of God's paths. Um, I think it's important to see what this text teaches us about God. Right? When you, and, and of course, the modern Western church leans away from God's wrath, typically, and further into God's love. God's love, absolutely, who God is. But God's wrath, absolutely, also essential to who God is, and it helps us to appreciate His love so much more when we have an appropriate understanding and comprehension of His wrath. God is scary. He is terrifying. It is not only the Old Testament that speaks to this, right? It's Hebrews that says to us that our God is a consuming fire. He is a Father who must punish. God brings men into deep waters, but, as John Augie says, not to drown them, but to cleanse them. Of course, chapter 3, there is a glaringly interesting section of it. Right about verse 22, it begins, and right about verse 24, it stops. <laughs> But verses 22 through 24 find themselves as, as sort of this strange island in this sea of suffering. I remember being struck by it because I knew those verses before I knew where they had come from. And so the first time I found them in context, I was startled by them. I mean, we've read parts of chapter 3, and it goes on like that. And then suddenly you read these words, Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. Because of his or for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion. Therefore, I will wait for him. I've looked at this passage in multiple Bibles. Um, and I found two, just in a handful of Bibles, two Bible subheadings for this chapter. God locked me up in deep darkness, is in one Bible. And there was another Bible that's, that titled this whole chapter, God's Great Faithfulness, which I think speaks to this reality quite nicely. Um, but, but here is chapter 3, and it is all God. Chapter 3 minus verses 22, 23, and 24 would be less God. Verses 22, 23, and 24 minus the rest of chapter 3 would be less God. But it is true that His mercies are new every morning, and what a glorious reality for us. I remember when um, we had two children, uh, we had them back to back, and they were both little, and I remember um, they were both, I mean, there were plenty of times when, when one of them would not sleep through the night, or both of them would not sleep through the night. They were both in that um, season at the same time, which made for, um, we, do, we just don't remember three years, basically. <laughs> uh, we just, who knows what happened. Uh, we all made it out alive somehow, but, uh, but I remember, I, I actually um, found myself spending time in this passage just by happenstance during that season of my life and I read about God's mercies being new every morning and immediately I thought of myself as a father and this daughter of mine who would put me through such great sorrow and misery and, and those 3 a.m. moments where you just walk in again to the room and you just try to beg, you know, beg her and plead with her to go back to sleep and yet she won't. She's screaming in your ear and you're trying and, and then you walk in the next morning and the sun's up 
And she's there with her arms up, and I'm thrilled to see her. My mercies were new every morning. Me. <laughs> Tiny, flawed me. How much more are our Father in Heaven's mercies new every morning? I think it's good to read Lamentations 3, and it's good to, to remember that moment in Galatians 3 where the clouds part and the light shines down, even just for a second. And to remember other places in Scripture that speak to this reality. Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse 32, I have no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the Lord. So turn and live. I guess the thought that I'd like to leave us with as we meditate on this chapter of Scripture is sort of two-pronged. Don't incite God's wrath. For goodness sake, let's just all resolve not to incite God's wrath because He is not to be trifled with. And don't lose sight of God's mercy because He is a Father who refuses to stop loving us, who refuses to stop offering grace to us. And so don't incite God's wrath, but don't lose sight of God's mercy. I'm grateful for passages like this that encourage me to do both. Thank you.